Today, we will be talking about macroevolutionary patterns. A mass extinction is a rapid decrease in the amount of life on Earth. This occurs when there is a sharp increase in extinction rate and a lack of speciation. Over the course of the Earth's existence, we recognize five notable mass extinctions. These include the Ordovician-Silurian mass extinction, the Late Devonian mass extinction, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, and the Cretaceous-Tertiary mass extinction. The largest extinction and the extinction that we are focused on is the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. The figure to the right depicts extinction intensity throughout history. The arrow indicates the location of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. The x-axis re represents extinction intensity and the y-axis represents millions of years ago. This event occurred about 252.3 million years ago, killing off nearly 80 to 96 percent of all species. As a result, it separated the Permian era from the Triassic period. The Triassic period, and in essence the extinction itself, started the reign of the dinosaurs and greatly diversified the terrestrial community. According to the study, terrestrial faunas began to provincialize following the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. To analyze the distribution of tetrapod faunas, researchers looked at the four components of biogeographic structure. The four components are connectedness, clustering, range size, and endemism. One species in particular that was noticed to have been prominent in this time were the archosaurs. They were able to thrive in the next few million years after the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. The, signif the significant differences seen in connectedness, clustering, range size, and proportion of epidemics indicate an increase in diversification and provincialization of terrestrial faunas during the Triassic period. Rise of the archosaurs occurred during this period as well. This event is significant because archosaurs are the ancestral group of dinosaurs, crocodilians, and birds. One major topic in macroevolutionary patterns is adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation is the rapid diversification of a species and usually occurs in response to natural selection and other ecological opportunities. One of the most well-known examples of radiation would be Darwin's Galapagos finches. Because of their location on an island, these finches rapidly diversified to accompany the different niches in their new environment, forming a vast number of species distinct from the finches on the mainland. Another example would be the Cambrian explosion. Prior to the Cambrian explosion, there is very little fossil record of any organisms. After, we get records of a plethora <coughs> of diverse animals, such as the trilobites, depicted here, stem mollusks, conodonts, stem echinoderms, and more. This leads us into the last group, the deep sea chemosymbiotic fauna. Deep sea vents and seeps are sulfide rich environments that were largely uninhabited by the late Mesozoic, early Cenozoic. As a result of this unoccupied niche, there was an ecological opportunity for the deep sea mussels to inhabit them. Deep sea mussels have a symbiotic relationship with sulfur and methane processing bacteria, allowing them to harvest energy without the sun. Because of this, the team wanted to examine the evolutionary history that led to the rapid radiation of mussels into these environments. In order to do so, they used five gene fragments and three different fossils to find the speciation rates of these mussels over time. They also used these fossils and evidence from extant species to determine the evolution of habitat use, body size, and symbiont type. In order to do so, they sampled 14 different species and sequenced their DNA through the use of a polymerase chain reaction, which creates thousands of copies of a particular gene that can be analyzed. Fossils were then used to calibrate the data in order to ensure accuracy of the findings. The team then used computer programs to reconstruct the most parsimonious evolutionary tree, according to the data collected. They found that chemosymbiotic mussels have an origin around 85 million years ago, and that rapid speciation in the deep sea occurred from 41 to 32 million years ago. The graph on the right shows the heightened number of lineages of mussels during this time period. In comparing this with their reconstructed evolutionary trees, it was found that the major radiation was not triggered by the evolution of different types of symbioses, as was originally thought. This was a major finding because the acquisition of sulfur oxidizing symbionts that is necessary to adapt to these environments didn't actually cause the radiation. As a result, it was theorized that the major diversification at this time occurred from environmental factors instead. Possible suggestions include habitat availability and increased dispersal capabilities. During this time, there was an increase in the appearance of whale carcasses. 
Whale carcasses are sulfide rich and seen as a stepping stone for inhabiting deep sea environments. There's also evidence of an increase in the abundance of seep carbonates at this time, opening more ecological niches for the mussels to occupy. All of this data leads to one major question. If the environment affected the chemosymbiotic mussels in this way, how were other chemosymbiotic deep sea taxa affected? My, my part of the group project centered on the macroevolutionary patterns of docampia vines and how their plant defensive systems and pollination attraction systems evolved through time. At the bottom of this slide, you can see a docampia vine. And now for the background information. Um, docampia vines are part of the family of a part of the family called Euphorbiaceae, where their genus is of course the docampia. They are found in tropical environments in lowland tropical environments where there are over 120 different species of docampia plants. 90 of them come from the Americas and the other 30 of them come from uh, Asia and Africa, specifically Madagascar. Docampia vines are unisexual flowers and have bisexual blossom inflorescences that act as pollination units. Most species in the Americas are pollinated by resin collecting male bees and about a dozen more species from the Americas are pollinated by fragrance collecting bees. In Africa and Asia, most of the plants are pollinated by resin collecting bees. The question tested. The question tested in the article was whether defenses can originate by exaptation from pre-existing pollinator attractants or vice versa. Whether plant defenses show escalation and if so, whether by enhancing one line of defense or by adding new lines of defense. They tested this question by using a couple different ways of analysis. First, they used phylogen phylogenetic analysis of chloroplast DNA of the Dale Campia vines. Uh, first, they used internal transcribed spacers, which is ITS, and external transcribed, transcribed spacers. Also, the molecular tree, they also um, created a molecular tree based off of concatenated DNA ETS ITS sequences, which were from single individuals of 81 taxes of the Docampia vines. They also used Plucan, Plucanicia and Tragia, Tragi which are closely related outgroup species of the Docampia vines. Um, Docampias originated, uh, diverged from Tragia, and they also used, um, to, they also used these methods to detect addition and subtraction of the Ocampia characteristics through time. Results. What was found in the article from through their research? It was, it was realized that the deployment of the defensive spines in Ocampia and the deployment of resin co-evolved with stronger evidence of, of this showing within the sepals on the plants, where big, big sepals covered the whole plants and this correlated with a stronger defensive spine. In some lineages, lineages <coughs> the resin <coughs> reward system was, cost, was lost when the Docampia plant shif shifted from resin collecting pollination to fragrance pollination. <coughs> This new pollination technique using fragrances was found to be highly correlated with the flower arrangement that covered the fruit, but no evidence of the two defensive systems uh, were found to be <coughs> uh, influencing each other. There is also evidence that triterpene res resin deployed for defense of leaves and developing seeds which means that the resin was first used to attract, but now they, it was used to um, help defend the leaves and the developing seeds on the plants. <clears throat> Some implications. Well, implications of this um, study found <clears throat> that um, most of the defense evolutions were from exaptation which means that the new Docampia defensive traits that were found were usually built off of previous existing traits, which is also 
why it is found why they found evidence of escalation in the amount of defensive systems, mostly early in the Decampia evolutionary uh, form, going from one defensive line in the beginning of their lineage to around seven defensive lines at the peak. At the bottom of this slide, you can see three different diagrams of the flower of the flower sepals. And this is because the first one is the inferred ancestral arrangement. This is how they first came up, came to. And the second one, which is evolved uh, arrangement associated with pollination by resin collecting bees, shows that the plants opened up and this is when the shift came from defense of male flowers with resin to attraction of pollinators with resin. <coughs> and the third one, the at atavistic defensive arrangement. This showed that the shift from pollination by resin collecting bees to pollination by other kinds of insects and redeployment of brackets in a defensive arrangement, which showed that through the time, the, uh, the lineage found that they also <clears throat> lost characteristics, but they also gained them back in different parts of the lineages. Adam K. Huttenlocker studied the body size distribution of non-mammalian eutheriodont therapsids or synapsida over the Permo-Triassic boundary to determine whether body size reduction occurred after this mass extinction. He was also looking at the patterns of body size change to determine if changes were random or occurred based on certain environmental or evolutionary patterns. Synapsida is comprised of mammals as well as pre-mammalian branches. A famous example of a synapsid is the finback dimitrodon pictured here. They were dominant in the time period looked at in this study, but their numbers began to decrease with the Permo-Triassic extinction, and as dinosaurs and archosaurs became prominent. The outdated term mammal-like reptile refers to these animals, but is no longer used as they are no longer considered a reptile. Huttlocker looked at two major patterns, stratigraphic and phylogenetic, in his study of body size. Using museum specimens, he compared body size to the strat stratigraphic location of the specimen. He also used the same time series model to determine if size decreased through evolutionary changes by looking at ancestor-descendant relationships. A close look at the two graphs created as data was analyzed shows that size change followed few time-based patterns. In the top graph, skull length is set against stratigraphic time and shows that though our, there are some decreases over time, there are also several increases, including one right after the extinction. This is a non-directional model. In the bottom graph, the maximum skull length found for a species is compared to the relative age of the species. The highest skull size is found in the oldest specimens, but only of one species. Then the numbers begin to even out until the youngest specimens are reached where the smallest skull size is found, but only in the other species. This shows that time period when the specimens was living did not have a great effect on the size of the specimen as age and size are compared in the phylogenetic patterns. Size trends were also examined within branching events using an informal super tree created by the scientist. Based on the data collected, size, body size changes were actually very rare. Any trends found can be explained by an overall decrease in large bodied animals as seen in the graph comparing age to skull length as opposed to a decrease in size within a species. It was concluded that during most of evolutionary time, changes in size have remained static. As geographic time progresses, large events such as mass extinctions cut off certain trends in macroevolution while allowing others to emerge. As seen in the first paper, dinosaurs and archosaurs were only able to diversify after the biodiversity dynamics of the terrestrial environment were changed with the Permo-Triassic extinction. As the muscles showed us, adaptive radiation is the result of multiple factors which can be environmental and or the results of interspecies, inter, interspecies interactions, not just one change or trend. Furthermore, intraspecies interactions result in co-evolutionary trends which help ensure the survival of both species. The plants increase their defensive capabilities in reaction to herbivores resulting in increased survival odds, a change which never would have occurred without the interaction of the two species. Finally, as seen with the rarity of size changes in synapsids, stasis is actually the most common trend, making the others necessary but limited to very short periods of geological time.